we're confronted today with a rather odd lesson in the gospel. One of those stories that we would prefer we didn't have to tell. Sort of a situation that is so filled with negative energies that it's hardly something that would inspire us on a Sunday morning to rise to the joy of the resurrection and all of the challenges that we face as followers of Jesus. And yet, it is important because it is quite instructive for us on a number of things. The most important and most central thing I would like you to think about today is Herod's predicament. Herod was in one of those situations where he ended up having to do something he didn't want to do because of his position. He was, after all, the leader of Galilee. After Herod the Great's death, his great kingdom was divided into four parts, and the Herod that we hear about today received one quarter of that kingdom. Philip, his brother, another quarter, and we won't go into how possibility was that Herod ended up with Philip's wife and all of that. All we know is what John the Baptist was saying to Herod was, this is wrong. You're doing something against God's ordinances. It was a prophetic word that John was speaking, calling Herod to task, calling Herod out for an act of unrighteousness according to the law of Moses. That is the prophet's role. Constantly to call the people of Israel, God's chosen, back to the terms of the covenant that was made with them way back in the desert. And so whether you agree with it or not, that was in fact what John was doing. He was following out his vocation. As a prophet, he was called to call people back to righteousness regardless of their position in society. We hear a term used today in our own society, without fear or favor. And it cost him dearly. Because it was making Herod uncomfortable was one thing, But when it makes the king's wife very uncomfortable, that's a whole nother matter, isn't it? And so, Herodias does something unmentionable. She decides in her mind that this one must go. And the only way to get rid of this stone in her shoe, as it were, was to cast it out to get rid of it, essentially what happened, to cut off his head. Because then he can no longer speak. It's been in popular films, and it's totally believable that even in prison, John would have been speaking this prophetic word, screaming up from the depths of the pit and making his voice heard by his jail keepers as well as those who were within sound distance. And if the prison was anywhere near the the king's palace, which it always was, the king could hear it as well. And so even though John was imprisoned, it was a constant annoyance. So when the opportunity came, Herodias struck. But I'm not really concerned about her. I'm going to go back to Herod again. Because Herod was one of these people who wasn't quite sure where he stood on these matters. He had the affairs of state, and he had his own personal life. And sometimes those two things didn't quite come together, particularly when it came to religious value and principle. It even says, as we heard in the Gospel text, that Herod liked listening to John. There was something attractive in that prophetic voice. There was something about the call to righteousness that made Herod think, this is something important, something I need to pay attention to. 
and yet the cares and concerns of his personal life and his life as a leader of the state got in the way. And so he throws a big banquet. It's a birthday, after all. It's the king's banquet. And his courtiers, the leaders, the prime leaders of the people that he was in charge of in Galilee, they were all gathered there for a great party. Probably more than a party, it was probably a bacchanalia, where everybody had plenty to eat and plenty to drink. And so Salome comes in and does this rather, well, we say the dance of the seven veils. We're not quite sure about that. That's not really come from scripture, but we, it's always been painted as this sort of almost lascivious sort of dance. And it attracts Herod. And it traps Herod. And suddenly Herod doesn't know what to do, and so he, he just spouts off. That was so wonderful. I'm so pleased with this. I'll give you anything you want. And to make his point, he says, with a solemn oath, it says in the text, even to the half of my kingdom. Imagine that. The king willing to give away half of his kingdom to this woman's daughter, not even his own. with a solemn oath that everyone heard. And so Salome, the young girl that she is, says, I don't know what to ask for. I can't run a kingdom, so what should I ask for? And that's Herodias' opportunity. And we hear the story. We know the story. But it's Herod that I want you to focus on. Because Herod is not driven by any positive value. Herod has been captured by fear. Fear. He could have gone back on his words, certainly. He said, well, that's too much. It's against the law of God. Or it is contrary to what the people out there want. I would have a rebellion on my hands. Because John was a popular preacher, particularly when he preached against Herod. And so it was that he was filled with fear. Fear about going against his solemn oath within the hearing of all those who were important to his continued power. And so to hold on to power, he was motivated not by virtue, but by fear. And that's the lesson we need to look at. And we need to ask ourselves that question. When we make decisions about our relationships one with another, when we make decisions about our relationships in our society, when we make decisions about our relationship to God, is our motivation really fear? Do we worship God and try to follow God's ordinances because we are afraid Afraid of what God might do to us. I'm afraid that's probably the most fundamental motivation that most religious people have. I don't want to go to hell. Rather than the motivation that has the power to cast out all fear which is the motivation of love. Because the bottom line is this. You cannot love that which you fear. When fear enters into the relationship, love leaves. Because fear and love are incompatible. It's true in our families. It's true in our society. And it's more than true with God. When we are more concerned about our fear of God and what God might or might not do to us because of what we say or do, can we genuinely say 
that my heart is open to whatever God wants for me because I know that God loves me. Loves me so much that if I do make a mistake, if I do err, if I do something that is against his ordinances and his commands, that God is ready always to forgive and to reconcile and to lift us up. Or do we continue in our fear? Because that same fear, like in Herod's case, will motivate us to fail to confront ourselves about our own shortcomings. We are afraid to admit that we can be wrong. We are afraid to admit that we don't know everything. We are afraid to admit that maybe I haven't always done everything the right way. And when that takes over, then love is elusive. Love seems beyond our grasp. Because love covers, as Scripture says, a multitude of sin. Because it is God's love for us, shown to us in the cross of Christ, that says there is nothing we can do to fully alienate ourselves from God unless we reject God's love. And if we are solely motivated by fear, we are in the process of doing that. That was Herod's failure. That he allowed fear to govern his life. Fear of his wife. Fear of his courtiers. Fear of the leaders of Galilee. Even fear of John and perhaps even fear of God. So this is a lesson we don't want to hear. These are words that are difficult for us to see as part of the joy of the Christian life. But indeed, they are the key. Because if we confront our fearful, if we confront the fact that we are motivated by fear. That is the first step of walking away as we seek the Spirit of God in our lives, which is not a spirit of fear, but of courage. Courage that allows us to make the decisions we need to make, to be faithful and righteous to the ordinances of God. And that key command, that key ordinance we know from Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. And if indeed that is our motive, then fear will disappear. My friends, fear causes us not to act. Love impels us toward compassion and outside of ourselves to make connections with one another. And in so doing, helps us to be the people God has called. Do not fear. Have courage. Seek the face of God. And above all, love. That is the lesson.